uh, 1.30, so I think I'll get started here. Uh, I'll be talking about my experience as Accidental Release Engineer. Um, I was not planning on being a release engineer, but uh, I ended up doing the release engineering for FreeBSD 13.2, and this is basically the story of how that happened. So just some background, I, I know a lot of you in this room know, know who I am, but uh, for people who are not, maybe not FreeBSD developers or people watching online who are, are not FreeBSD developers, um, I've been a committer since January 2004, so I guess uh, a bit over 20 years now. Um, I spent almost seven years as the security officer, so I have uh, a lot of, of uh, background in that area. Um, that was sort of how I got into FreeBSD because I was interested in security stuff. Um, in my time uh, as security officer, um, and just before that, uh, I wrote FreeBSD update and port snap, which a lot of people have used. Um, port snap is now deprecated. We want people to just use git instead, which you know, git was not available when I wrote port snap. Um, FreeBSD update will be going away once we move over to package base at some point. Um, hopefully 15.0, whenever it's ready. Um, as I mentioned, uh, interest in security. Um, also, as security officer, I was dealing with very sensitive information about uh, vulnerabilities that had not been disclosed publicly yet. Uh, that led me to launch an um, online backup service, Tarsnap. Uh, essentially, this was a case of, I needed this. I asked around, could it, was there anything good that other people in the security community knew? And they said, no, but if you build it, we'll use it. So I built it, that is my day job. Um, and because I was doing Tarsnap, uh, I wanted to use Amazon Web Services for that, that mostly so I could access Amazon S3, um, but that led me to um, developing the FreeBSD EC2 platform um, because I wanted to use FreeBSD somewhere close to AWS, which meant you know, in, in uh, EC2. And I've been doing that since uh, 2010 is when I first got it booting. So, the beginning of this story, um, in March 2015, I, I worked with Glenn, to, Glenn Barber, the release engineer, uh, to integrate the FreeBSD EC2 builds into the FreeBSD release engineering system. Uh, prior to that, I had just been building the YAMIs myself, uh, but it, I thought you know, it would be great if the project could build them rather than it being just something that you know, Colin built uh, on, on, on my laptop. So Glenn had, in fact, put together a, a very good, uh, very flexible, system for building VM images as part of the release process. So I was able to take that and, and uh, make just a very small number of changes to it uh, to turn it into a general cloudware uh, system, uh, which I then you know, added like the code for, for EC2 specifically. Um, essentially, an EC2 image is just a FreeBSD VM image, or so, you know, FreeBSD disk image, really, um, with a few extra packages installed so that you know, take care of things like printing the host keys in a particular format that EC2 expects, um, getting user data from EC2 and processing that, stuff like that. Um, in August 2010, the uh, deputy release engineer at the time had to step down for personal reasons, so Glenn was looking for somebody to, to take that position, uh, and he, he said, well, you know, you, you've, you've worked with the release building bits a little bit, so because I had worked with him on the EC2 bits, um, so he asked me to step up as, to, to take the role of deputy release engineer. And uh, his comment at the time was, well, I, I want somebody I know I can trust to take over if I get hit by a bus. So for two years, basically, I just sort of watch and learn. I'm on the, the release engineering mailing list. Um, so you know, I see people, you know, all, all the emails. Glenn was very good at CCing the release engineering list every time he was emailing somebody about release engineering stuff. So I, I saw everything that he was sending out to people, and I saw all the emails people were sending in saying, hey, I've got this, this patch. Can we merge it to whatever release is coming up? Uh, and and you know, you, usually again, Glenn would reply yes, and sometimes he would reply saying, uh, no, not right now, because we're in the middle of building things, but ask me again in two days. And sometimes he would say, uh, that's an awfully big patch why do we want to take that in the week before the release? Um, so it was good for me to sort of get a, a sense of how, how the release engineering process works and you know, general sense of, of what would be reasonable for people to do. Uh, and then he also walked me through the process of building the weekly snapshots. Um, 
a few times. Um, most the, the latest one was in October of, of uh, 2022. Um, I never actually built the snapshots myself, but uh, Glenn always used Tmux for this, so I was able to SSH in and attach to his Tmux terminal and watch him typing. Um, and then as he was typing commands in, I was selecting in my, in my terminal, copy, paste into a separate text file. Um, so I had, had notes of all the commands that Glenn ran uh, to, to do those, those weekly snapshot builds. So that was fine. I, I was happy being a deputy release engineer. And you know, the, the idea was if he's ever away for the weekend or you know, can't do a weekly snapshot build one week, then I could SSH in and, and do those builds. Um, December 12th of 2022, I got a text message from Glenn. And I was a bit confused. Uh, if anybody knows how to translate that into English, I would be very interested to hear what you think it means. Uh, I, I asked Glenn later what, if he knew what that meant, and he was not quite sure either. Uh, as it happened, I was sick at the time with influenza. I had a fever of uh, 104 Fahrenheit. Um, and so I completely forgot, forgot about this weird text message that, that he sent me. Uh, and then a few days later, I noticed Glenn wasn't replying to emails because uh, some emails had come into the, the release engineering list and nobody had replied to them. I thought, yeah, Glenn's usually more on the ball on this. What, why isn't he responding to those emails? Um, and then I noticed he, he didn't do the, the next week's um, weekly snapshots, which was very unusual for him. Uh, and then a couple, email, a couple days later than that, uh, I, we got an email on the the release engineering list saying, uh, well, Glenn's in the hospital, he's sedated on a ventilator. Which is not really the sort of email you want to get, well, about anybody, but uh, especially not about the, the release engineer when you are the deputy release engineer. So I sent an email to the release engineering team saying, well, I guess I'm in charge now. Um, I'm the deputy, so I, the deputy takes over when the release engineer is uh, not available. So I start running the weekly snapshot builds. Um, I had been you know, fully briefed on, on how to do those, um, more or less. Uh, nobody seemed to notice that no builds were done on December 17th, uh, or that it was me sending out the, the emails on the December 24th. I guess people were busy with some festival they have around that time of year, uh, not paying that much attention to email. Uh, but out of respect for Glenn's privacy, we, we didn't want to, you know, shout loudly, hey, Glenn's in the hospital. So uh, we, we did our best to sort of keep things under wraps, hoping he'd be back soon and could take over again. Uh, and, and you know, maybe nobody would even notice. Uh, but you know, news spreads, people started asking questions. Um, oddly enough, nobody asked me any questions. You'd think if the release engineer is not responding, you would email the release engineering mailing list or email the deputy release engineer. No. Uh, People were emailing Deb um, the, from the FreeBSD Foundation and asking her, hey, do you know what's up with Glenn? Uh, Glenn worked for the FreeBSD Foundation for a while, so maybe that's why they thought she would know. I don't know. Um, but anyway, questions were coming to me secondhand. Say, you know, people saying, hey, I have been asked what's up with Glenn. Do you know? Um, so you know, it, it became clear uh, that Enough people were asking questions that uh, we had to say something. So on uh, January 3rd, I sent an email to the uh, developers list saying, well, I'm, I'm wearing the release engineering hat. Uh, Glenn is presently available, so uh, unavailable. So as deputy release engineer, I'm running things for now. Uh, so at that point, you know, I'm, I'm in charge of release engineering, uh, but I don't know, can I actually do this job? Um, never done it before. Um, and I'm looking at the calendar. Uh, well, it's uh, January 3rd at that point. Um, we announced a couple of months previous um, the release cycle for FreeBSD 13.2. Um, it was starting um, January 28th. So I sort of had three and a half weeks to, to figure things out before things really got rolling. Um, so I, I, I keep doing the, the weekly snapshots, that, that I knew how to do, um, and then I get a, a message, I think it was from uh, Trouble, uh, sorry, that's Philip Papes. Um, 
saying, hey, the, the FTP mirrors are running out of disk space. Um, well, Glenn had told me uh, you know, in my instructions on how to do the weekly snapshots that uh, I needed to remove the old snapshots from FTP master. So I thought, well, that's strange. I'm, you know, I'm putting on the new snapshots, so I'm getting rid of the old ones. So why, why is something strange going on here? Um, well, it turns out that what he had for forgot to tell me was to remove the old snapshots from the release building systems. So every week I was building the new snapshots and then copying everything from the release builders over to FTP master, including all of the previous snapshots that I had just deleted from FTP, FTP master. So once I added to my release, my, my snapshot process, remove all the old snapshots from the release builders, um, that was fine. I wasn't copying, you know, five or six uh, old snap, weekly, weekly snapshots on every week, uh, and then FTP mirrors go back to the right amount of disk space usage. A couple weeks after that, I, I, I got an email saying, hey, I noticed the, the basic CI images are over a month old. Um, basic CI is a, a VM image we build, which is used for continuous integration. Um, we build it as part of the weekly snapshots. Uh, and I thought back to what Glenn had told me uh, back in, in October previous. Um, after the snapshot build finishes, there's, there's these basic CI images. And I, I copy them over to the FTP staging directory manually because it's a bit messy. But you know, don't, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll deal with it. Well, you know, he, he wasn't around. He wasn't dealing with it. Um, so fortunately, the previous basic CI images were still there on the FTP servers, so I could figure out where they went and how they were named and, and where I needed to copy them. Um, so it took me a while to uh, put it together, but we, we, we now have a, instead of being a, a manual process of copying things in, we, we now have a, a shell script, which we run, the, we run the build and then I run the script to take those basic CI images and, and put them in the right place um, on the FTP staging directory. Um, after 14.1 is out, out the door, I will be moving all this into the makefile.mirrors um, so that it doesn't need to be a separate sh script. Um, but that was you know, another hiccup that I, I didn't expect because I, you know, Glenn had told me not to worry about it. I promptly forgot about it. Uh, and uh, it was only when somebody pointed out, hey, this is broken. So January 21st, um, Glenn woke up. Um, he, he was checking his email uh, and, and responded to me on, with text messages. Um, he was still on supplemental oxygen. He had trouble walking, but he was mo more or less able to sit, sit up in a chair and, and occasionally pull out a laptop and, and look at things there. Uh, but he, it was clear he, he was going to have months of physical therapy um, to, to recover from being, you know, having a, a tracheotomy, being on a ventilator, um, you know, he, he, he was in, in bad shape and his, his lungs were in terrible shape. Um, so, you know, he was not going to fully recover until the summer at least. So we talked it over and agreed. That it made sense for me to be the public face of release engineering. Uh, but, but he would be available as much as he could be, mostly over text messages because he could have his phone easily at hand um, so that if I ran into any major problems, uh, he, could, he could help me out with the process. So... February 10th, uh, we create the Relang 13.2 branch. Um, so we, we take the, the 13 stable branch and, and fork off the, the release branch. Um, and I start the, the beta one builds. Creating a branch is so much easier than in the old days. You know, it used to be that, that when, when we were creating a, a release branch, we had to email the, the repo master and say, we need to, to fork this thing and do some magic, run some magic scripts that edit all of the, the .v files, uh, or comma v files, sorry, uh, in, in CVS. Uh, now it's just git branch, git push, and we have a new branch. Um, so that's, that's very nice. Um, I'm, I'm glad that uh, git has at least made that easier, easier for us. Uh, the release building scripts, uh, which is a, a, a wrapper around the bits that are in, in the FreeBSD source tree, uh, are in the release engineering SVN repository. Uh, we haven't moved over to Git because yeah, SVN is working fine for this. So probably no point really moving. Um, and, and Glenn is able to SSH in uh, and uh, copy the build scripts from 13.1 to 13.2. And he tells me, well, yeah, the, the release build, it's, it's the same commands as the snapshot builds. You know, 
you, you should have, shouldn't have any difficulty. So I start building. Um, well, the builds are managed root because they need to do things like creating true roots and uh, creating ZFS file systems and you know, all these things that you, you, don't, you really don't do as unprivileged users. Um, and, and the scripts are checked out from this, this SV entry, uh, which is on free fall. But when I'm root, I can't SSH into free fall to update the SV entry because I can't SSH into free fall, free fall as root. Um, well, it turns out the, the solution here is that the, the checkout needs to be group writable and owned by the relang group. And then I use SSH agent forwarding to SSH into the, the build host and run the SVN up. So then it forwards the agent over to Freefall so that it can get the bits from Freefall uh, to pull them over to the builder. One of these things that like one, once it's explained to you, it makes sense, but I spent a long time trying to figure out how, how can this possibly work? Uh, before Glenn was able to explain to me how it works. We use a lot of Z uh, ZFS file systems in the snapshot or, and release building process. Um, we, all of the builds need to run in a, a clean world. So we, we build, uh, it's a, a, an AMD64 system, so we, we do a, an AMD64 build um, of whatever tree we're building um, and then create a true root with that and then we clone that for each of the separate architectures. Um, well, architectures and in some cases kernels for like um, AMD uh, ARM, ARM builds. Um, but it, create a whole bunch of clones of those. And then we run make release, uh, well actually release.sh which runs make release within each of those. Um, and then we've got the source tree is in a separate ZFS file system which gets mounted everywhere. And the ports tree is also in another one which is cloned and mounted everywhere. So yeah, it was something like 40 or 50 ZFS file systems mounted um, by, you know, in the middle of this, this build process. Um, but these file systems have different names depending on whether you're building a snapshot or a release. I'm not actually sure why it's separate name, different names, but it is. Um, and so the script for cleaning up after you've done a build to get rid of all of these to make space for the next build um, needs to be slightly different because it has the names of the file systems coded in. So the first time I tried to build 13.2 uh, uh, beta one, uh, it failed because there were old file systems left over from a previous build that were getting in the way. Um, but eventually I, I figured out what the problem was and updated the, the, build, the, the cleanup script to take care of those. Um, releases use quarterly packages where snapshots use the latest packages. So as part of switching over to beta one, I changed the places where it says latest to say quarterly. Um, but just to confuse things, the git branch is not named quarterly, it's named whatever the quarter is. Um, so my, first, my, my, my second attempt to build beta one uh, blew up when it tried to check out the quarterly branch of the ports tree and there's no quarterly branch of the ports tree. Uh, it would be great if git had some way of like Having quarterly be an alias that is whatever the latest quarterly branch is, I don't, I don't think that's possible in Git, but it, it would be fantastic if, if you could do that. It would just solve so many mistakes. Sorry? Theoretically, at least, in symbolic references. Okay, I'm told that theoretically symbolic references can do that. Maybe somebody here who's, I know, involved with Git and ports can, I see Rene waving his hand. Can, can you fix that for me? Right, it sounds like the answer is maybe. So that, that's something that people can look at afterwards. I just I thought I'd mention it because it is some. I, I'm sure I'm not the only person to make this, this mistake of trying to check out the quarterly branch of the port streak. Yeah, each each of the quarterly branches is is branched from latest, yeah. but it's branched with a name based on the quarter, not based. It's not just named quarterly. Um, 
the second year, which is for me because that give on one point three per share. Yeah, we would need some way of, of having quarterly change from pointing at one, one quarterly branch, pointing at a different quarterly branch. But anyway, I'll, I'll move on. Um, that's something that you guys can uh, figure out later. Um, so anyway, I, I finally managed to, to get the, the beta one builds finished. Um, well, so it's the same commands, except it's not just the same commands uh, as it is for weekly snapshots. So, uh, as soon as we get the, the beta one builds finished, um, well, FreeBSD update doesn't do the weekly snapshots, but it does do the betas and the release candidates. Um, fortunately, I wrote FreeBSD update, so I knew exactly what needed to be done here. Um, so when the builds finish, I, I collect together all the hashes of the, the DVD ISO images, uh, and I send those hashes in a GPT signed email to the security team saying, here's the hashes, please start FreeBSD update builds for 13.2 beta one. Uh, and then I need to wait for them to reply saying yes, all the bits have finished building and they have been uploaded. Uh, I think two, maybe three times during the 13.2 release cycle, I forgot to wait for them and sent out an announcement saying this release, this, this beta is ready and then got a bunch of replies back saying, but I can't FreeBSD update to it. So I now have uh, in, in my uh, release building checklist, uh, uh, in capital letters, wait for the security team to reply <laughs> saying the bits are ready. <laughs> for weekly snapshots, we have a script called generateemail.pl, which generates the email. Um, basically, I just take that email, download it locally, I sign it with my GPG key and email it out. Um, occasionally with the weekly, weekly snapshots, I need to edit it a little bit. Um, if, if a build breaks, um, some, some places it, it gets automatically removed from the announcement, um, the, the snapshot announcement, and some places it doesn't. Um, sometimes at the, the end of the announcement, which has all the checksums, uh, it will just say like AMD 64 checksums and then have blank space if those didn't build. So uh, sometimes there's a little bit of very, very light editing I, I do to those uh, snapshot announcements, but, but generally I just take what that script produces and sign it and email it out. Betas and, and release candidates, we have a separate template. Um, but to make things confusing, we still use the generate email script to generate an announcement and then throw away all of it except for the section that has all the hashes because that's how we get the hashes to put into this other template. Releases need release notes. Uh, I am terrible at documentation. Um, most of you here will have come across Graham, my brother, he was at the registration table. He works for me and, uh, at, at Tarsnap and I hired him because I'm terrible at documentation and he is fantastic at documentation. Fortunately, FreeBSD also has people who are fantastic at documentation. Uh, Mike Carrolls has, has been doing the release notes for quite a while uh, and so when I sent out an email saying, hey, can somebody do the doc release notes for 13.2? He immediately said, yeah, I've done it before, I can do it again. So that was the easiest part of the release process for me. I did absolutely nothing there except say, yes, Mike, please do the work. So thank you, Mike. <laughs> Couple betas in, I got an email saying, hey, I noticed you haven't been putting the signed checksums of betas onto the website. Um, so we don't just put the hashes into the beta announcement that we email out. We also GPG sign all those hashes, um, or files containing those hashes, uh, and put them onto the website. So after each build has been finished, um, I mentioned it's not just the same commands, it's the same commands plus extra things. So one of the extra things is we download all the hashes from the builders, um, from the builder, um, sign all those hash files, um, and then commit them into the, the docs repository. Couple of weeks after that, I got an email saying, hey, I noticed you haven't been updating the MISC FreeBSD release manifest port. Um, this port has hashes of all the component tarballs which make up a FreeBSD installation. Uh, I, I should have remembered this because I actually created that port a while back. Um, it's, it's used by Poudrier to verify uh, the bits that it's downloading from FTP servers if you tell it, you know, I, I want to create a, a package jail uh, for building packages on FreeBSD 13.2 beta 2. Now, I don't know why you would particularly want to build packages on 
13.2 beta 2. But if you did, um, the moment that beta 2 is out, um, as long as you updated the FreeBSD release manifests package, which you can do securely, uh, you now have the hashes, and so Pujara can get those bits and verify that you are getting the actual 13.2 beta 2 um, for your package building jail. So another thing that needs to go onto my uh, checklist is after each beta, again, download those, those manifest files and commit them all into the ports tree. Um, in fact, not just commit them to the ports tree, but commit them to the latest branch of the ports tree, and then immediately merge them to the quarterly branch of the ports tree, because somebody might be wanting to choose Portrait Error from the quarterly branch. So those are all things that sort of I, I tripped up over because it was my first time running the process, and I was sort of learning how do we actually build a release. Um, but that's not really what the release engineer should be spending their time on. You know, that stuff is all things that once you figure it out, it's all in the checklist. You just run through the commands each week, each week for each build. Um, the main job of the release engineer is sort of project management. Um, if the developers aren't managed well, things are just going to drag on. People aren't going to get patches in in time, and you're going to get another email saying, "Oh, this is still broken. I need to get this patch in." Oh, th it, this other thing is still broken. I need to get this patch in, and it you know, eventually you end up finding yourself doing release candidate six. Uh, I was saying yesterday uh, in the developer summit, when you get to release candidate one, it should mean mean this is something that we think is a candidate to be a release. It, it, it should be something that we think may be ready to go out the door. Now, you know, maybe there will be problems that will come up, but if you get to release candidate six, you, you've gone off the rails because you, you should have found problems before you got to that point. But as it was, I was, I was so busy just learning how to build the release, um, figuring out how all the bits get together, um, that I wasn't really paying attention to chasing people about issues that hadn't been fixed yet. Uh, and so, in fact, we ended up at 13.2 release candidate 6. Good news is, the next time around, I was able to do a much better job. 13.3, um, we had release candidate 1 followed by 13.3 release. And 14.1, we had release candidate 1 last week. And at this very moment, uh, we are getting the bits in place for 14.1 release. The, the ISOs have been built, and uh, as of a moment before I started my talk, uh, the, the builder was currently building two copies of the Rust compiler because it needed that to build the Azure upload tool so that the Azure images could be uploaded there. Once the final release images are built, um, we need to make them available in various clouds. Um, Amazon Web Services has the AWS Marketplace, which uh, as a FreeBSD EC2 maintainer, I was already uh, intimately familiar with, uh, more familiar with than I really wanted to be. Um, there have been a number of rough edges over the years, but I, I am happy to say it is a lot smoother than it used to be. Um, in the early days, I would upload disk images and they would run through a, a scanning tool that was you know, used to make sure people weren't uploading disk images with, with malware attached. And, and every time, uh, I would upload a free busy image, it would spit out an error saying it, it can't scan this image because their tool uh, understood um, Linux file systems. And it would say, we don't know how to mount this thing called UFS. So it would spit a, a, an error back and I would have to email them and say, yeah, can you look at this manually? Your tools don't, know, don't, don't understand UFS. Um, you know, they, they could only, they, I, I think actually they could do visor FS at one point, but it mainly was, it was X2, X3 that they could do. Um, but that's all. And, and then if I was lucky, I would be uploading the disk images on, on the Friday, and then sometime on Monday, they would finally approve the disk images to go in. Um, recently, it's been much faster. I, I put the images in, and like half an hour later, it is available, and people are getting emails saying, FreeBSD, whatever release is available, and then I start getting confused emails saying, Amazon says this release is available, but I, I haven't seen a release announcement yet. And I have to write back saying, yeah, the, the announcement's coming on Tuesday, but it, it is there. Um, it, it's actually something I was talking to uh, the, the marketplace people about um, a few months ago that I would, I would like to have a way of, of uploading the images and having them approve the images, but
but gated so I could press a button later to actually make them available. Uh, because I don't want to wait until Monday before uploading them in case something happens um, that delay does delay the process. Um, but in any case, I knew how to deal with that. Google Cloud and Azure also have their own marketplaces uh, with somewhat less streamlined processes, somewhat more manual processes in some cases involving people from those companies. Um, but in any case, once we have all the bits built, uh, I send out a whole bunch of emails to various people saying, we have bits for your cloud. Do the things that need to be done. Um, with, with AWS, I mean, it was, it was Glenn emailing me to say, do the things that need to be done with, with EC2. Um, I don't need to email myself, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, a bunch of emails go out. And depending on how quickly things happen, um, the release an announcement either says, FreeBSD 14.1 release is available in X marketplace, um, or it says, FreeBSD 14.1 release is expected to be available soon in marketplace. Um, we would like it to all say is available in, but uh, if people don't, we, we don't want to say is available and then have users say, but it's not there. Um, so hopefully, you know, most people will be reading the announcement a week later and, and see that it, it is already there, but uh, some people are very, very fast to, to look at emails. So release announcement text. Um, the releases get announced on the FreeBSD website. Um, we do not use XML anymore. I am happy about that. We use a doc, ASCII doc. We also take this ASCII doc announcement and convert it to plain text, GPG sign it, and send that out to the mailing list. We also take that GPG signed plain text announcement and put it back onto the FreeBSD website. And, and it is linked to from the ASCII doc file, which it is compiled from, if that makes any sense. Um, because you want people to be able to go to the website, get the, raw, the, the text file, and verify the GPG signature on it. You can't, can't really verify signatures on the HTML, which is produced from the ASCII doc, because other parts of the, the, web, of the, the website change, and you know, stuff that's in the, the, the uh, headers and, and um, on, on the left side of the, of the website uh, change, so you can't verify the HTML. So as with the, the betas and release candidates, um, these announcements have hashes that are generated, produced from the generate email script that we use for weekly snapshots. Um, but unlike the beta and, and RC announcements, uh, there's a significant amount of non-boilerplate text. So it takes several hours of emails, emailing core and ports manager and cluster admin uh, and package manager and security team and of course release engineering team um, to make sure that we all agree on, on all the things that go into there. Um, you know, questions like, so we've got a list of companies that have supported release engineering. I don't know if this company still exists. Uh, I don't know if this company has done anything for us in like five years. Should we be taking some of them off? Does that, did anybody know what these companies are doing now? Um, and you know, what tends to happen is we're, we're, we've, we've, we've already got all the bits for release ready. Um, we're looking at the clock saying, well, we need to send out this, this announcement in like two days. We'll just copy the announcement from last release and edit the stuff, you know, change the version number and all that. Um, and so things like that, you just sort of get accumulated uh, technical debt, except it's, it's not really technical, but uh, um, things, things accumulate in those announcements. Um, I've n I now have a, an item in my release building, my, my release cycle checklist saying, uh, when we get to a week before RC1, start putting together the release announcement and send emails out to people saying, is this correct? Do we still need to list these people here? Do we still need to list these companies? Uh, has anybody died? Because if any FreeBSD developers have died, then we, we put a dedication into the release announcement. You know, I, I always hope that nobody dies. Um, it, it is good when we do not have a dedication in the, the release announcement. Um, and usually if somebody has died, I have heard about it, but I, I want to double check. I don't want to miss somebody because I forgot or didn't see the email. What happened recently? What, in your team, did they die? Uh, HPS? Uh, I think we dedicated the last yeah, release to him. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I see people nodding up there. Um, 
I was worried for a moment there because I, I had the, the announcement already made for 14.1. I just deleted that section. Um, so yeah, anyway, a bunch of emails go out um, to, to make sure that we all agree on what is going to be in the, the release announcement email. Um, and then the, the last thing I do um, now with that, that announcement is put in all the hashes that I get uh, after the, release, the, the, the images have finished building. Oh, I, one of the hardest things actually in the, the release announcement is the first section in that email going out saying, some of the highlights are, because I need to go through six months of commits and try to figure out what will users care about the most? Now, okay, I don't need to go through all the commits. I look at the release notes, because hopefully if there's something really important, it will be in the, in the release notes. Um, but the release notes tend to be fairly verbose about what has changed, so then I need to figure out like, how do I distill this paragraph down into one line, um, and, and again, decide which of these things people care about. So if, if there's some, some, something you really think needs to be highlighted in the release announcement, let me know. I, I'll probably be happy to put it in for you. And uh, this is basically the end of the story for 13.2. Um, April 11th, 13.2 uh, was released, and I handed the release engineering uh, system back to Glenn. I said, you know, I have done my release, you're it. So epilogue to the story, um, in November 19th, uh, Glenn was re-hospitalized due to uh, long-term sequelae of, of his earlier illness. Uh, the, and the FreeBSD core team asked me to take over the job of, of release engineering lead on a, on a permanent basis. So I am now the FreeBSD release engineering lead and uh, I've now done 13.3 and 14.1 is about to happen or in the process of happening depending on what you consider it to be done. Um, the day after Glad went back into the hospital, uh, I announced 14.0 uh, release. Um, I felt bad about this, that I was the person sending out the email because some people immediately wrote to me personally thanking me for the release. I had to write back saying, no, Glenn did all of the work for this release. The only thing I did for that release was the last bit of editing on the release announcement and sending out the email. But uh, I am happy to say that uh, thanks to ongoing treatment and also significantly uh, avoiding the stress of free best release engineering, uh, Glenn is doing a lot better now. Um, I, I would say his, his uh, from talking to him, I, I'd say his, his condition is better than it has been uh, since he first went into the hospital. So uh, a positive outcome there at least, uh, although the project uh, is worse off without his, his contributions. Uh, he spent a decade running release engineering and all of, all of the bits we use, I mean, the, Glenn wrote the scripts for building the release, all the building the releases, then he rewrote them um, to use ZFS, and then he rewrote them again when we moved over to Git. So like, it, it is all his work that I'm using for the release engineering, uh, release building process here. So lessons learned. Um, have a deputy. If you are the release engineer or the security officer, you need to have a deputy. Uh, Mike Carroll's agreed to be deputy release engineer um, when uh, Glenn, when I took over from Glenn. Um, I'm very happy to have him here. Uh, and he has already done one of the weekly snapshot builds. Um, and he will be doing the next release, uh, previously 13.4 release, um, so that he has experience going through the entire process. It probably will not be a literal bus that takes someone out. You know, we, we talk about if I get hit by a bus, but that is actually, you know, although we always use the same euphemism, well, not really euphemism, but although we always, use, <laughs> although we always say the same thing, um, you know, it, it is probably not going to be a literal bus. It, it may be somebody is getting divorced and they just have no mental energy to deal with FreeBSD, or it may be they're in a coma in the hospital, or they may get arrested. You know, there are many possibilities, um, probably not getting hit by a bus. I, I will try to not get arrested, yes. Um, stay in regular contact. Um, this is a mistake that I made. Uh, Glenn disappeared and I was sort of, well, I was sick at first and then I was dealing with a two-year-old, um, one and a half-year-old at that point. Uh, and 
I, I didn't do anything until I, we got an email saying, hey, Glenson Hospital in a coma. Um, I, I really should have stepped up earlier and said, OK, Glenn doesn't seem to be responding. I, I guess I should take over now. So yeah, stay in regular contact. And, and the deputy, if, if, if the lead stops responding, then the deputy just needs to step up and, and take over on their own, not, not wait to be told that there's a problem. Uh, you need to train your deputy, tell them what needs to be done, and then have them practice. Um, Glenn had told me what to do. Glenn had given me instructions on how to build weekly, weekly snap, snapshots. Um, he had not given me a lot of instructions on building releases. It was kind of the same and kind of not the same. Um, or kind of the same plus extra things that are not done as, as part of the weekly snapshots. Um, but I, I had never actually done it myself. We had talked about it. You know, I, I had had several conversations with him where I said, you know, maybe we should have the deputy do one of the weekly snapshots every month. And, and maybe one of, one of the beta builds for every, every release cycle. But you know, he was busy, I was busy, I had a toddler. We just didn't get around to it uh, until it was too late. So yeah, Mikey's going to be doing the next release. That is his practice. And hopefully, I'll not get hit by a bus or in a coma or get arrested. Uh, and if he has any problems, I will be here to uh, point him in the right direction um, so that he has gone through the entire process and knows what needs to be done. If in doubt, ask for volunteers. I mentioned that uh, I didn't know what to do with release notes, and Mike immediately stepped up, saying he's done it before, he'll do it again. Um, there were also a number of things on the website. I, I'm not a doc committer, so I don't even see the things that get committed to the, to the website. Uh, and Glenn was a doc committer. He was doing all sorts of website-related things for the release that I wasn't, wasn't seeing. Uh, and so when it came to me doing the release, I just sort of went on to the, the BSD Docs IRC channel and said, hey, uh, there is stuff that needs to happen on the website. Um, can somebody do it? And I can't actually remember who it was. I'm sorry. Uh, whoever it was, thank you for doing it. Um, so somebody immediately stepped up and said, yeah, I'll, I'll keep an eye on, on the emails. Every time a beta comes out, I'll, I'll update the website with the things that need to be updated. Uh, so yeah, there are people out there who will volunteer. You, you just need to say, hey, I need help with whatever. And people will help you. Um, this is actually something I, I discovered um, back in my days as a security officer. Um, that was a great job for learning all about FreeBSD. Because I could go onto IRC and say, hey, I need help with this random part of the FreeBSD system. And whoever was responsible for it, or, or even people who hadn't worked on it but, but knew something about it, would immediately drop what they were doing and come to help me. Because they knew that if I was there asking for help on some weird part of FreeBSD, it's because there was some security issue. You know, I, I wasn't just asking because I was curious. There, there was something in FreeBSD that, that needed to be dealt with, and they would drop whatever they were doing to, to come help me. So it, it is great being uh, in this position of wearing a hat, where, whether it's security officer or release engineer. Uh, it's a volunteer project, but, but people are very happy to volunteer if, if you know, it is clear that there is something that needs their expertise. Uh, and, and finally, there's a lot more moving parts that go into building the release than, than I realized, at least, uh, before I started. Um, you know, as a FreeBSD developer, before I got onto the release engineering team, you know, I just sort of saw releases happen. You know, I tried to get my patches in in time, and sometimes they were a bit late. I was sending emails at you know, release candidate three saying, yeah, can I get this, this fix in or get this new feature in? And Glenn was always amazingly accommodating to me. I, in hindsight, you know, he should have been telling me, no, Colin, you're, you're too late. Come back in, in six months. Um, but uh, you know, I, I learned more about the release process when I, I joined the release engineering team. But really, it was not until I started doing releases myself that I, I realized just how many moving parts there are going into this. Um, I, I haven't even mentioned packages here, um, because that's something that I really didn't need to deal with. Um, by the time that the release engineering team had to worry about packages, Glenn was up and on his laptop, and, and he sort of dealt with them. Um, but in addition to all these other things, there's quarterly package sets that get built, and then one of those needs to be copied over to be the release package set. Um, which is something that needs to be done by cluster admin because it involves copying bits around on, on the FTP servers. Um, Glenn was on cluster admin, so he did it himself, of course. Um, 
now I email cluster admin and say, hey, can you copy these things? Um, and they are always very happy to help me, but uh, it is another thing that needs to be dealt with. That's all I have to say. Um, happy to answer any questions. We have a microphone here, which uh, will get you onto the recording and also help everybody else hear you. Can you uh, pass that back to David? Uh, the microphone's better for, for being picked up. So you have a lot of responsibilities here, and I noticed that there's a lot of things that remain manual, not, not for any reason, like, not for bad reasons, I understand that, right? But uh, do you have room in, your, in, in the group for someone to help you do more automation around that, or? So I, I, I have been gradually taking these things that are, are more manual and, and scripting them. You know, I, I mentioned the, the basic CI bits. Uh, Glenn had been just copying manually at the, the terminal, and I turned that into a shell script that did the copying for me, and I will be putting that into the um, makefile.mirrors um, so that it, it is actually done as part of the build process. Um, some things, like, you can't really script sign the PGP sign these things because or you don't want to because you, you want to make sure whoever's doing it is looking at them and typing in their passphrase um, to, to unlock their key. So I, I, I would say I, I'm, I'm in the process of scripting as much as can reasonably be scripted. Uh, it would be difficult for somebody else to come into the team and learn enough about how it all works to automate things before I get them, self, them automated myself. Um, now, it would be good to have more people on the release engineering team. Um, I do not want to be a release engineer forever. So if there's somebody who you know, is imagining maybe taking over as FreeBSD release engineer in a few years, um, Mike volunteered to do this upcoming release, but I, I don't think he wants, has, aspires to be a release engineering lead uh, for, for a long time. Uh, he, he, he's, he's deputy and he'll take over uh, when needed, but uh, he is retired. Sometimes people who are retired like to enjoy their retirement. Um, so yeah, I, I, would, I would like to have more people on the release engineering team learning how things work. And uh, at some point, I will be happy to hand off the baton. But yeah, getting back to your original question about automation, uh, I, I don't think that's a particular thing that, that I need help with. Well, I think having other people doing the work with you and learning the process is ultimately the same thing, right? So. Uh, if other people are, well, yeah, I mean, I, I will have more free time in the next three months with, with uh, somebody else running uh, the next release, yes. Yeah, most public automation scripts work curl. Doesn't that mean they only use them? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that hurts. So the, the, the question is, is uh, those scripts that are in Perl, does that mean that only I can read them? Uh, I mean, I didn't write them, so I, I, don't, I don't know if I can read them. Um, I think Glenn wrote those scripts. Uh, although he might have copied them from a, a previous loose engineer, I'm not sure. Um, those scripts are actually fairly straightforward. Uh, I, I have had to make the occasional edit to them. Um, the, the, originally, they were only listing one uh, EC2 image, and, and now they list multiple EC2 images. So I, 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 am, I am able to make some very slight changes to those scripts. But Perl would not have been my choice of languages, but you know, the code is there. I'll, I'll use it. I'd be interested to hear um, any observations you have about the structure of the project from the perspective of uh, this role. You mentioned a couple of things about uh, the, the interactions among teams and the benefits of having uh, somebody who's on multiple teams. Um, any reflections on uh, things that we might be able to I improve or tighten up in that regard? Uh, reflections on, on the structure of the FreeBSD project, that's a a broad question. Uh, I, at the developer summit uh, yesterday, or maybe the day before, I, I was suggesting that it might be useful if the release engineer was a, an ex officio member of core, just to not, not as a voting member, but just just to to hear what's going on uh, in case there's there's discussions about the future of the project that that will affect you know release building. Um, but aside from that, I know I. I I feel that, I, so I, I am also a member of the security team, again, not to be involved in security things, but just to be aware of what's going on, because if, if an open SSH vulnerability lands a day before it's going to do, do the release, you know, 
I'm, I'm not going to do the release. I will wait for it to get fixed. Um, I, I might even hold up the release for an open SSL vulnerability, although those happen a lot more frequently. Um, and and they, they, have, they have a bad habit of scheduling their vulnerabilities to come out the week before our releases. Um, not sure quite how they managed to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of the structure of the project, I, I don't know. It, overall, I would say it works pretty well. Um, I, I, I remember I, a couple of weeks ago, I, I was asking the, the, the package manager team, can, can you send me an email when these package builds finish? Um, but you know, I, don't, I don't want to be subscribed to, to hear about every single package build that finishes. It was just that particular one I wanted to know because that was the one I, I was waiting for so I would have a package set to get into RC1. So no, I, I, I would say overall, uh, it, things seem to work pretty well. Uh, right behind you. Uh, so when you talked about your lessons learned, um, a lot of those seemed like uh, they were f lessons for um, the project as a whole. Um, and what I'm interested in is if you have any advice or cheat codes for uh, someone in a deputy role to be successful specifically. So while, while this is advice for you know, how you might want to run your project and things you should look for, look at as maybe fr someone from the senior role looking down. Uh, do you have advice for the other role um, from the lower role looking up? Well, uh, I mean, a lot of these do actually work both ways. So, I mean, I say train your deputy to have them practice, but if you're the deputy, then get trained and practice. <laughs> uh, you know, if, if, if you're the deputy, then, then yeah, you, you should be talking to the lead and saying, you know, hey, here are things I don't understand. I might need to replace you, so please take time to explain to me how this works. And you, know, you have told me how this works, but I've never done it myself. I'm not entirely sure if I can do it myself, so is there a time that I can do it and you can watch over my shoulder? Um, and well, I mean, stay in regular contact, that is very much something the deputy needs to do because they need to step up if, if the lead stops responding to them. Um, so yeah, I, I would say, most of this does apply to, to both sides, just from a different perspective. Um, yeah, I, I would say the most important thing for, for, for deputies is just you are there in a learning role, and you need to uh, take the initiative to make sure you learn things and ask if you're not sure about things. Because you know, often, often the, the lead has been doing things for a while. It, they, they learned how to do things a long time ago. And they, they don't know what you don't know. So yeah, you, you, you need to, to take the initiative to say, this is what I don't know. Please explain to me, let me practice um, so that I will be ready. Thanks. Any more questions? OK, that's it then. I'll let you go a few minutes early.